Hey, welcome to Hot Takes. I'm your host, James Scott, here to analyze anything and everything interesting. Let's dig into today's topics. All right, so we're back with another episode. And today we have a very special guest on the podcast with us. His name is Daniel Frankel, and he works in the sponsorship sales department over at the MLB, and he personally is a sales service executive. So, Dan, if you want to go ahead and say hi now. Oh, I like that. I got the, uh, the cue to jump in. That was perfect. What's up, everybody? How are we doing, James? How are we doing, Chris? Doing perfect. well, doing yep. well. So we happy. have... Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say happy to be here. This, yeah. is, uh, this is exciting. I used to do a little podcasting back in the day, so I'm having some, uh, some nice flashbacks coming back <laughs> to me. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, like, how, how, how quick it comes back. And, you know, it's interesting. Whenever you get done recording a podcast, there's, there's, there's almost a little high. You want, you want to do another one. And that's something that I've, I've found is when I record, I want to get, you know, right on to a, another podcast. So, uh, it, you know, in upcoming weeks, I'm actually going to be talking with Chris so I can get a live podcasting setup. So after we do our shows, I can jump on and we can take questions live and I can just talk with very cool. Very so, cool. Uh, I might have to phone we, in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be fun. It's going to be a good time. So, uh, but before we get caught up uh, in, in too much of that stuff, we have a whole bunch of really interesting questions for you. Um, so, well, you are, before before you yeah, start hitting him with the questions, why don't you no, let no, uh, why don't you let him explain uh, what he what he fully does over at the MLB? That was going to start, be one of yeah. my first questions, actually. <laughs> this is so like we're, we're same cop here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I James got you. I got on the hot seat. Chris saving the day. <laughs> Uh, so for me, I, as Chris said, I'm a sales service executive over at MLB. Uh, I've been in this role for almost two years now. And before that, um, I assisted our sponsorship group in client services for another uh, three years. So we're looking at five years under my belt in sponsorship. And what I love about it is not only are we out prospecting, looking for new business partners in emerging categories and, and high yield industries, like the Grubhubs, Uber Eats of the world. And now we have Daily Fantasy, DraftKings, FanDuel coming in. You know, everyone is trying to get their hand in the pot there. But then it's also how to strategically keep on the books what we already have. Um, so you look at your telecommunications deals, your banking partners, how do you set yourself up for success down the road? Okay, wow. That's sorry a lot. About, yeah, sorry oh, about that. Wow, no, no, you're good, you're good. That's that's a lot. And, and, and congratulations, five years. That's, that's, a, that's a, a good deal into uh, that position. It uh, was um, honestly, so I worked, I've been working in baseball since I graduated um, college and it took me a little bit of time to find uh, honestly a job in anything. And eventually I landed a role um, for a minor league independent baseball team that no longer exists anymore hopefully not my fault because I was in charge of the social media back in the day. This was like free Instagram too. And back when Twitter was 140 characters or less. So these were certainly different times and social media, no one really knew exactly how to use it and how it could be a way to sell tickets. Um, and through that job, I landed a gig at something called the MLB fan cave. Uh, yes. I love which that. Was, which was a very cool opportunity. And I think still to this day, my parents, don't believe it was real. And honestly, it's probably one of the reasons why I got the role is because I didn't over pursue it or get too excited about this potential dream job as they called it. I just sort of went through the motions and said, okay, you're gonna fly me out to Arizona. You're gonna take me to spring training? Sure, when are you gonna ask me for my credit card information? Like, let's be real here. Uh, so through that, I ended up uh, landing the gig. They had eight fan cave dwellers in the year 2014. Uh, it was our job to watch every single baseball game, analyze every single pitch. And then on top of that, we were also a, basically a fan destination. So if you were traveling from out of town and you were in New York and you were a huge baseball fan, you could hop in there and check out old baseball memorabilia. It was also a shop. Uh, there was gifts and goodie bags along the way. And then on top of that, it was also a home for baseball players who were looking to build their brand uh, to stop by when they were playing the Mets or Yankees. So think like, 2014, Charlie Blackman, Kevin Kiermeyer, young guys, 
right out of um, you know being drafted, looking to try and build their social media presence, looking to become more of a household name. And so we would shoot like 30 seconds to one minute videos. And unfortunately, back then these would be posted to like Vine and just a blog. There was no TikTok, there was no Instagram story. So I think it was a little bit ahead of its time. Now, honestly, I think it's perfect with all these different mediums we have available and the way that social media is 24 seven constantly. Um, but obviously that was a great experience and, and helped me get my foot in the door at MLB. Yeah. Oh my God. That would have been a dream. Like my goodness. I almost actually worked for uh, sports info solutions. I was offered a job uh, for various different reasons. I didn't take it and at sports info solutions. We were going to be doing basically the same thing, watching every pitch of every wow. game, like three games a day. I was really excited about doing something like that, but I'd imagine it's tiring, right? Yeah, I think I gained like 20 pounds and <laughs> I got tired of seamless uh, being delivered all the time. So we, you know, if there was a game going on, let's say there was a noon, you know, first pitch for the Cubs at Wrigley, but then you also have a 10 p.m. Angels athletics game. You're in that cave the whole time and you can't leave and you need to make sure you have your eyes on the screen. So it was a fun summer, but I also missed a lot of time with my friends and family and holidays. Um, so there were sacrifices along the way, for sure. Wow. Still, man, for me, like as an analyst, that is a dream. Now, I want to jump into something else. And this was something that I kind of wanted to talk about. I was like really curious about. And I didn't ask this the last time we spoke. And I think it's a perfect time to ask this on, on the podcast right here. Um, uh, so, I'm nervous. Yeah, when, when you when you're in this uh, sales position, this really well, you're, you're a sales service executive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, how big is the importance of selling whether a team's going to win or whether you know players are going to do certain things? Because I'd imagine, like one thing that I've noticed with regards to MLB, that at least you know has been something that that has fluctuated is every certain amount of years MLB declares, you know, this is our group of guys that we're going to market and they market them. And then it changes and it changes and it changes. And I seem to remember like when I was growing up, like it was like Ken Griffey Jr. It was Derek Jeter and it didn't change for years on end. Right. So how much are, is what you do uh, about, you know, uh, being in touch with people who do player analysis or, or does that not matter? Or is it about which teams are going to be more successful? How does that play into what you do? Do you talk to people who do that type of thing? Yeah, it's, it's an there. awesome, <laughs> no, it's an awesome question. I've actually never had that one before in, in any interviews or conversations I have. And I love it because it's one of the most interesting parts of my job and working for the league is the different amount of layers and departments that go into making something happen. So in your question, you asked not only about teams, but you asked about players and you asked about marketing. So those are all three totally distinct and unique areas. So for us, from a league perspective, you know, we're obviously rooting for every team to be as good as possible and, and put a great product on the field. But then on top of that, if you look at just the NLE specifically, that's five companies right there. The Met so their own company, the Nationals are their own company, the Marlins are their own company, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. All 30 is their own business. So we bring it all together in one house in the league. But at the same time, each club needs to be out there, you know, selling their own deals, whether it be more local and, and tied to New York specifically. You think Shake Shack, New York, those type of things, more of a local business. But then you bring up a great point as well about the marketing campaigns. And if you remember recently, there was the Let's Play Loud campaign, which starred like Mike Trout and Tim Anderson. That was brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. I'll tell so, you, those are guys that are going to be good for a while. I mean, Trout's the greatest, but you know, <laughs> Tim Anderson's going to be good for a while too. Absolutely. And he's going to be very marketable for a while because he's a player that likes to get on base, steal bases, flip his bat. You know, he's very animated. Yeah, there's the bat flip. Very animated <laughs> out there. Flip. <laughs> it works. It works. Um, and so from, from our perspective and where I sit, we work very closely with the marketing team on, on who they're looking to market and who they're going to be bringing forward. There's a huge push for Ronald Acuna and Juan Soto. And oh, so yeah. when that stuff comes out, we make sure that we get it in the hands of our um, sponsors as well so they can push it out on their channels. 
so that it's basically not only is it a sponsorship, but it's also a partnership. So everyone's working together to build the brand. Wow. So basically uh, teams then would be coming to you and be like, these are the guys that we specifically want to market. So is that, is that what you're trying to say here that like, you know, yeah. that's how they are involved? In, in like, a way, yes, yeah. we can do a, a league shoot. Let's say we're doing a league shoot with, um, in the past, I remember there was one with Cody Bellinger and yeah. Yelich because they were both trying to be the MVP. Oh, that, I loved that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. <laughs> so that was something that the league put together. But at the same time, the Dodgers can definitely use it and the Brewers can definitely use it because it makes sense for, for their teams. So there's always this swim lane and opportunity for the clubs to jump into what the league is doing and vice versa. Sometimes the clubs do incredible stuff and you'll see from the MLB Twitter handle or MLB Instagram, we'll be sharing it or we'll be promoting it as well. Whether it's like a funny Oakland A's video or the athletics are doing something silly with Tito. Like there are all these different outlets that, that make it kind of come together and, and bring the sport. I know we've talked about social media a bunch, but it's just so important to bring the sport into the 21st century. And our team does an incredible job at that. Oh, wow, that now that is an answer. I'll tell you that. It, it's interesting for me because uh, when I look at different front offices, different front offices obviously analyze their talent in different ways, and they put together their teams in very distinctly different ways. Uh, in fact, uh, I was going to talk with Chris about this on a separate podcast, how basically all the top 10, 11 teams in baseball are put together completely differently and it, it makes 2021 a really wild season. So if, you're, if, you're, if, if different teams are analyzing players and, and valuing different things in different ways, I'd imagine that when they would come forward for you know, who to advertise and, and, and uh, who to promote, each individual team would, pr would be evaluating their own guys, assessing their own guys, and based on that, who they would want to be marketing based off of their internal numbers. So possibly the reason why the, the, the marketing over the years has been some players that were only good for a few years and then weren't good for a while is because teams didn't know how to assess their own talent. That, that's interesting. I wasn't even thinking about it from that perspective. That's interesting. I wow. think some, yeah, it's, it's not only just baseball, but I, I think in all sports, you don't always necessarily know what you have. And Justin Turner, who just resigns with the Dodgers now, the Mets and Orioles, if they had known what they had had with him, they would never have DFA'd him. So it just goes to show um, it may take some time for these guys to fully hit their prime. I think we're seeing a trend, and I don't want to go off on a totally different tangent, but I know you and I can talk about prospects, I'm sure, forever. But we're seeing, oh, yeah. we're seeing uh, a, new, a new trend in baseball where these guys are not being held in the minors for two, three years to develop because the best time for them to develop and the best place for them to develop is at the major league level facing major league pitching. So I think we'll see Adley Rutschman pretty soon. I think we'll see Spencer Torkelson pretty soon. Uh, it's kind of like the Chris Bryant effect, basically, where they get them up quicker and they forget less about service time. It, I think the guy who's going to come up, like if we're talking about, and I'm 100% I'm in agreement with you, I think the guy who's going to come up, and I think not a lot of people are thinking about him this year because, you know, obviously they're going to wait until the service time, you know, two months in, a month and a half in, really. Uh, so you get the extra year of team control out right. of him. Jared Kalanick, he, he, to me, looks completely big league ready. I don't see any reason to keep him in AAA or whatever like that for half the year, even longer than that. That's a guy that 100% move him real quick through the minors. If you got the body for it, you got the skill set, I see. Why not do it? Why not? That one, st that one stings as a Met fan because, oh. uh, you, know, you know, he was in the Mets farm system and – that trade at the time, um, again, you don't always know what you have, but it, uh, it looked like the Mariners got the best of the Mets in that one. But we continue to have a busy offseason. We continue to be in the headlines. Um, and uh, we should have a good product on the field without Kalenic. So hopefully better than Seattle, at least. I'll tell you, you know, we just did a, uh, a podcast the other day, Chris, where we were talking about finishing up our uh, National League East division. Definitely check that out if you yeah. haven't seen that. Hopefully the uh, Mets are at the top. Well, you'll see if you go check it out. Please <laughs> <laughs> are alert. I'll say that there are good things. There are good things if you check it out. I'm not going to give away anything, but there's like good that. news. There's good news. So. <laughs> it's going to be a it's going to be a hard fought division this year. Obviously, the Braves have won it the past couple of years, and they haven't really fallen off at all. 
They have a lot of good prospects coming up with Waters and Pache as well, so they're going to be right in it. And then the Phillies, they didn't really change anything, and they get Real Muto back, but it's not really a plus. It's just the same team out there, so I don't think that they have you know what it takes. I think they'll be in the mix, but will fall off late, and then the Nats are always a wild card, and then, of course, the Mets – should hopefully be uh, be fighting for something. And honestly, you can't rule out the Marlins, considering they made the playoffs last year. We have to give them a little more credit. It's, so, it's in my opinion, the best division in baseball. Yeah, yeah I think it's pretty clear. Sure. Yeah. And, and, well, I mean, like the Phillies, even if you're looking at the Phillies, yeah, they have basically the same team coming back. But I, I have a feeling that they're going to be the team that ends up with Gardner. They do need a center fielder. Gardner's been able to play it. And, you can definitely I don't play know center. If that increases their war, but that's it, it doesn't make them that much better. Um, yeah, at, but then of course you had that. You, you got to add the fact the full season of Alec Boom at third, right? So that helps. And then they did bring in Matt Moore, who found out how to pitch. You know, like an ace in Asia. Maybe he'll you know bring it stateside. And they do have Spencer Howard, but I'm not particularly big on 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 the Phillies. You know, I think what the Braves did recently in adding Ozuna has moved them right back up to uh, where they used to be. I think the Nationals are a, a, a very underrated team. They've made a lot of small moves that have added up to quite a, a very well-balanced roster. Um, yeah, and then, of course, with Turner and Soto, like you mentioned earlier with Soto, that is – that Turner's about as good of a leadoff hitter as they, you get. They Soto's continue about as good to find a, a way. Leader. They're, they're a good organization in, in finding a way to always compete and making smart signings and doing what they have with the finances available. And I mean, it's, it's no secret. It's been a very tough year for, for all sports and for a lot of industries as far as revenue goes. So this off season has been a sign of that. Um, I and mean, we saw early on that players were reluctant to sign right away. We saw some deals we thought um, might've gone for more than they did we thought there would be some longer deals as well. Um, and, and it's just all a product of what we're going through right now. I'm sure you've talked about COVID on this podcast and I'm sure everyone has had COVID fatigue, so we don't have to talk too much about it, but it certainly affects the sport of baseball um, in a lot of different ways, including our department. Too. So one of the questions that we had for you, um, and this is a pretty big question of all the different sides to your job, what do you see as the biggest driver in, in sales uh, of, of all the different factors, at least in your eyes? It's a very, I, I guess, specific question for, for where you, oh, no, no, what it's, your it's a take good question. Very good question. I'm trying to just rack my brain here because I could take this a bunch of different ways. As far as the biggest driver, if you mean product specifically, like an MLB product, we have the MLB.TV subscription service. So mm. that is all the 30 RSN feeds from, you know, all the teams. And that gets stripped into our product, MLB.TV, which used to be streamed out of BAM Tech, which did HBO, WWE, March Madness, all that stuff. So we've had this technology forever and we continue to refine it and make it better. And basically what we do is we take that product, we strip out all of the commercials that would run on, let's say, SNY or Yes Network, and we input our advertisers instead. So we generate a large sum of revenue through our .tv product by bringing in um, a bunch of different advertisers. And basically the big sell is that not only is it a subscription, so you're going to be reaching generally affluent people, um, but on top of that, it's not skippable. It's live game inventory. And then furthermore, it's always going to be taking up your whole screen. So if you're watching it on your phone, you can't swipe out of it. You're not going to leave the game and go on Instagram and come back to the game. Like who's going to do that? And on, or you could watch it through your Xbox or PlayStation. So it's extremely versatile. For that, it, it's a huge driver in sales. But then uh, long-winded answer, that's probably the best media way that we drive revenue. And then we have a bunch of corporate sponsors as well. So I think we have this year around 40 to 42 corporate sponsors. And you'll see all these sponsors at our big drool events. So you'll see them opening day, opening week. You'll see them in all-star with signage. They'll be on the field. Um, you'll see them in the postseason as well. Think like T-Mobile for the Home Run Derby. Think Chevy for the MVP award. Budweiser, all, all of those big players, um, they're in the space as well. And, and we're growing that, that category too. So you'll see a bunch of new ones this year. Uh, we just signed on for, for 2021 Hyper Ice. So like the, the Volt Gun, um, those type of categories are coming in. You'll see 
more of you know sports betting. You'll see more of uh, delivery service um, and uh, QSR restaurants as well. So continuing to carve up the categories, the corporates and, and the dot TV, I would say were the two the two biggest drivers. Um, and then of course people being out there and and connecting with these people and and finding a way to get the deal done. Cool. Oh, that's cool. A lot again. That is, no, you're good. You're absolutely good. That's. That it's better for the podcast to understand all the different angles um, of this. Now, one of the things that I was thinking of while you were talking uh, was, so if, if you're talking about your, your side of the business, is there a possibility of expansion into uh, one way or another into predictive fields? Because it's one thing to, you know, be interested in, in what a current product is. It's another thing to have uh, uh, an accurate idea of what that product is going to be. And, you know, uh, every team likes to say, hey, we're going to be the next big team because, of course, they'd say that, right? Right. But is there any sort of possibility of usage of that kind of data from a alternative source? So might be this one might be out of my league. I'm not entirely. Uh, I, I know from like trying to games and predicting the games, uh, like that. That's definitely going to be up and coming on the horizon as far as products go. I think you're going to see more and more, whether it be in stadium or on your mobile device through the MLB app. You'll most likely be able to predict what the next play of the game is going to be. Whether let's say Trevor Bauer is pitching to Pete Alonso, you could probably through your MLB app, predict what you think will be the outcome of that at bat. I certainly see baseball trending in that direction, as well as other sports. This whole user and fan interaction with the sport as much as possible and getting that screen and that second screen to bring you into the game and hook you. I think that's where we could see the game going for sure. And that, of course, when there's new products out there, that'll, that's going to lead to new revenue streams. So it's certainly a great opportunity. I'll tell you, because that would be a dream for me, like just going in and being like, all right, this guy next pitch is going to hit like a double to the opposite field or whatever. That's going to happen. Yeah, I promise. Man, that's you so cool. dream, dream bigger. That's going to be happening. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So um, from your also opinion, um, what is the type of sales uh, marketing that I guess would appeal to, you know, your, your average fan? Like, what are you selling to your average? But now you're talking about, we're not, not like the guys who are invested. We're no, talking no, no, about no. just getting people in, in the door. I would say, and I'm a little biased here, but I personally like branding that's not in your face. So it needs to have a nice organic um, blend, whether it be a product or um, a credit card, like, I, I could scroll through my Twitter timeline and, and not, you know, I mi miss every ad and skip all of them. But the things that stand out are the things that you know were creative and the marketing team behind whatever the company was put in a lot of effort and it just works. So that may be an endemic product sometimes. If you look at the Hypervolt, um, Fernando Tatis, they have a deal with as well as a, a league deal with us. And I love the, the stuff that they put out because it makes sense. So whether... Tatis hits a home run and maybe he needs to go back to the dugout and use it. Like that's a great product placement and it makes sense. We have a official pain relief cream of MLB called blue emu. Um, and that's another one. So these guys have this cream in the dugout and it gets picked up on TV and you wouldn't believe like the amount of sales that they generate just through that. Because if you're seeing Mike Trout use blue emu and you don't even know what it is. And now all of a sudden Mike Trout's using it. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to Google it and, and, and figure out what, what that is. So to me, I think that's way more effective in ways than, um, you know, a 30 second commercial or um, here's the, here's a home run presented by um, whatever it may be. Um, so that's what I think has the most impact, but at the same time, it's all about finding that right balance. And that's what I honestly do on a daily basis is I create plans for these companies so that they're not necessarily only doing Mike Trout, Blue Emu in the dugout, but they also have TV inventory. They also have social media, they have banners, they have free roll, they have all these different outlets that we sell so that you are hitting, to your point, the average fan, you're hitting the young fan, you're hitting the old fan, you're hitting everyone. Um, so that's basically what I do on a day-to-day -day is put that together for them 
and make sure that their dollars are being used in the most strategic and efficient way possible. Wow. And, and you know, that sounds like you, you really got a great handle on it too. I mean, coming from, you know, player analysis, you have to understand how a player is good, not just when the pressure is on and they're facing higher levels of competition, what it's going to look like, what their, their, their approach is going to look like, how aggressive they're going to be inside, outside of the zone, what mm-hmm. kind of balls they can hit to what field. I mean, they might not be as successful versus a fastball as versus a changeup or a breaking ball. And then you could maybe put it in certain sequence to get them out. Maybe go inside, outside instead of up, down to get them out. Maybe they're a uh, lefty, so you have to use a lefty. You know, yeah. you need to be able to filter all of those things, and that's just hitting. You add the defense, you add versatility, you add the possibility of moving somebody's position, you add their handedness, you add their base running ability, you add their throwing arm. There's so many layers if you're going to it's do crazy. this the right <laughs> way. So it, obviously, you know what you're talking about because you have you know all these layers that you're you're clearly engaged with in order to be as effective as possible. And one thing to mention, because you bring up all of these layers, is think about how many baseball games there are in a season versus the other sports. So 2,430 baseball games, you don't get anywhere near that with the NHL, the the NBA, or, you know, clearly the NFL with only 16 games per team. So we are on almost every single night. So you really can't escape us. And not only that, but a lot of the other major sports in a normal year pre-pandemic are not on either. So we're center stage. We're on all summer long, the dog days of summer. And, and people, they, they see us. And whether it's through the amount of sheer volume we have or the impact of our star players, uh, it makes a lot of sense to partner up with our league. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in a time like this. I think one of the big things that really blows me away about this era is that there's more historic players in this era. And if they're not historic players, more historic years in this era than I can ever possibly remember any era in the past. And I've covered the game. I've been studying the game since I was like seven We're spoiled. years old. We're very know. spoiled right now, James. Yeah. So much talent. So much talent. So much talent. It's, it's great. It's really, it's really the golden age. and it, At least that's, what, that's how I feel, you know. You got guys who are teams, like. Yeah, yeah go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead. Yeah, there's guys like Kershaw. I mean, Kershaw, he announced that he may be retiring at the end of the year. His career literally mirrors Sandy Koufax. Um, you got guys like Trout, who, you know, people compare to Mickey Mantle. I mean, you got Soto. If you watch Juan Soto and then just picture Barry Bonds in your head, you can't get that comparison out little, of your head. Little smaller like once that, you, but yeah. Once you watch it and you see it and you're like, oh, he yeah. was left field. He was left field. You know, now, now Soto's the right fielder with, with uh, Kyle Schwarber with the Nationals. But, it, you know, he was left field, left field, power and patience, power and patience. Now, Bonds was faster. Uh, but, I mean, Soto was doing things at an age that, you know, well, look, when Bonds was in the big leagues at a young age, he was doing great things. But he right. wasn't doing what Soto was doing at Soto's young age. Like Soto just blows my mind with how good he is. We are, uh, you know, we are blessed right now for sure. And I think it's only going to get better. And I don't even mean that from an MLB employee. I just mean that as a fan of the game, you look at the advanced scouting that's going on and you and I could talk advanced scouting for days, but look at where the Blue Jays are taking their organization with the injection of young talent with Bichette and, and Vlad Jr. and Biggio the three big names right there, they're, they're all going to be household names by the end of this year if they're not already. And on top of that, like, it just continues to grow. So, guys who even had a down year last year, Mookie Betts and Yelich in the regular season, like, it was a 60-game season. These guys are going to be studs next year. You got Eloy and Robert on the south side in Chicago. Like, the Cubs may have taken a step back, and now this rivalry is going to be, you know, Chicago. The White Sox might – might overtake the Cubs this year for all we know. So there's a lot of good storylines coming up. There's a ton of vets that are still good with Freddie Freeman and Rendon. There's a ton of young guys coming up. It's a really, really good place um, to be for the sport right now. I think, you know, the only one of, one of the bigger reasons that Yelich had such a down year was he was coming off of a knee injury, like literal right. knee surgery. And like for a guy like him, who's really uses his front knee in his swing, that's going to take a little bit for him to recover from and get it, you know, 
his lower body back into his swing. And uh, the one thing I got to say is I think Biggio is probably going to end up as like a super utility player. Obviously, he's a big name because of his father. But in the minors, he actually was kind of billed as this, this super utility bench player who's going to be about a league average hitter. And then the juice ball came in to AAA in 2019. And then I don't he know came what you're up. About. Yeah, we, no, that, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. So uh, I, I think that there's definitely a little bit of regression coming for him. But if we're talking about another guy who's got uh, baseball bloodlines with the Blue Jays, who I think is going to also be a stud, dude, my, my boy, Guriel, Laredes Guriel. Okay. I love that guy. He's so good. And Teoscar Hernandez, too. There's- Big time power. I worry a little bit about like Pedro Serrano disorder, you know, uh, having issues against the breaking ball. Yeah. Uh, that started to become a bigger thing as the season went on, but he's got so much power and he does so have a, de- a good degree of speed that not a lot of people talk about that. If he just ran the bases a little bit more with the amount of power that he has it may not matter that he can't, you know, hit every breaking ball. Should right. he be able That's to fair. foul off enough of them? You know what I mean? I think he'll but, be, uh, I think he'll be fine. We, we could talk, and we could talk baseball can't... analysis all day, man. We could do this. The Oscar all day. Hernandez <laughs> talks. <laughs> Yeah, I was talking to somebody last night about Teoscar, actually, on, on, really? on, on their podcast. I'll tell you, I, I, I'm active on YouTube, on, on a bunch of different people's podcasts, trying to figure out, you know, different people's opinions. I, yeah. I disagree with a lot of people's opinions. <laughs> That's the beauty of baseball. He does. Yeah, man. He does. Well, so far, I feel like we're agreeing, which is good, unless I'm doing something wrong. No, man, we're, we're on the same page here. Um, so Chris, do you have any other big questions for, uh, Dan here? So, I mean, I think we covered mostly everything, uh, cause Dan, uh, we, we actually previously met to form our questions together, uh, for you. That way we were prepared and didn't waste your time and stuff like that. So Not- yeah, no, James, actually, I think one of those questions was actually mine and, uh, James asked it for me. Uh, so I think we're, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty clear. I can't think of anything right now at the moment. The one thing I, I do want to loop back to is like, there are so many like predictive systems out there, you know, uh, like fan graphs has like steamer and they have like, they have like these, these, these four different, Dakota, and, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. all of those. And mm-hmm. Like a lot of the time, what those systems do is they average things instead of being bold enough to say like, you know, okay, this is the year this guy's going to be big. Right. They, they take it between what the, the worst is expected and what's the best that is, that's expected. Median. They, they find the medians with everyone. Yeah. I just, yeah. I wonder if there is an outlet where people could put in projections and, and compete in that kind of way. Um, and how that could be possibly weaponized to bring more interest to the game. And uh, your thoughts on that, at least. I did want to bring that in. It's a very cool idea. I know there's definitely, um, and what we do at the league level, there is a, a pick em, like game, basically, where you can predict how the standings will, will end up, um, which is a lot of fun. But I've never heard of anything at the player level um, so it could be a very interesting idea, whether that's on MLB or off portal as a, as another site, like a fan graphs um, to just put in your, it seems like put in your predictions for guys. And if you're right, yeah. rewarded for it. And if you're wrong, obviously you have to suffer the consequences uh, in some way, whether that's monetary or through points and there's a point system. Um, I'll tell you like yeah. people, people who are like absolutely incredible at baseball analysis, They'd come out of the woodwork. You know, you, you could look at who, who's closest to being the most accurate. Oh, right. my goodness. That could, be, that could be a really engaging way of getting some of uh, the smarter baseball fans that have kind of been lost out in the, 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 the pages, the, the eons of the internet. The, you I know, will say everyone, uh, they always remembers the prediction. They always remember the predictions they got right, and we don't really hear about all the ones they get wrong. So... Yeah, that would be a way of people being yeah, hold you to it, hold you to it. I think it's a cool idea, definitely worth exploring. All right, Dan. Uh, well, I think we got all of our questions for you out. Uh, I know that I'm going to be reviewing all of your answers because you, oh, that's so much information, but I love it. That's what that's what I I was hoping to get here. So absolutely, thank you for coming on. 
Thank uh, you guys. This was uh, this was awesome. Again, like great to get back in the podcasting space. I'm always down to talk baseball, especially yeah. with two guys as uh, educated on the sport as you guys both are. Have such a love and interest for this growing game. So this was honestly a, a pleasure on my end. I had a blast. We got to have you back on here at minimum to just talk about players, just just to just chat ball. Uh, Whatever you want. We can, we can ditch the sponsorship stuff. It sounds like you'd rather just talk players. That's okay. Well, yeah. hey, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's not my side of the game, but I am very interested in how my side of the game can be used to bring, you know, attention to the game, to bring, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, fans to the ballpark, to make people – more excited about baseball because I feel like the baseball isn't properly being weaponized yet. There's so many things that information that's out there that your average fan doesn't understand that if they did, maybe they'd want to go to the ballpark more, you know? Right. Um, I think a yeah, lot of, there's definitely a divider in the casual fan, the avid fan, and then the next level fan who's, who's digesting all the data. We try and make sure that there's, some sort of opportunity for all of them. But I think you're right. I think there's certainly uh, ways we can incorporate data even further into our game than what we already have. Yeah, and I think one of the, the, the bigger misconceptions, and I guess I'll, 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 I'll end with, 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 with this and our, our tags, of course. Um, but I think one of the, the bigger misconceptions is that the money ball theory works within context, that when players are reaching their peak, and they're dialing in the strike zone from an aggressive approach, that that results in more walks than power. And now you have fans and some teams that are just valuing the results. The fact that there's a lot of walks high on base percentage, the fact right. that there's 25 home runs when you're facing 24,000 pitches per season for a full season, you know, per 1,000 pitches or 100 pitches rather. Yeah, per 100 pitches, you're going to get a mistake pitch if you're fouling off enough pitches you'll hit 20 homers over a full year i think there's a misconception over which players are more valuable than others just because results don't tell a player's approach if that makes sense yeah i think you've uh, you hit the nail on the head there for sure there's a uh, game is certainly going to be taken to the next level in these coming years man it's going to be crazy it's going to be fun to watch the information age <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. Pleasure. I'm glad you were able to join us. Uh, definitely course. like, subscribe, and we'll see you in the comments. Thanks, guys. Take care.